Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of the Legal 123s with Bert Adato. I'm your host, Brad Adato, with my co host, Michael S. Bird. Thanks, Brad, and I appreciate the S. Nice addition. As a business and healthcare firm, we meet a lot of interesting people and learn their amazing stories. In today's episode, we discuss what every business must have and sometimes wish it didn't. Every business must have employees, but no business wants the disruptive ones. Before we get to our special guest that we're going to talk about today, Brad, would you like to hear some workplace trivia? Do I actually have a choice of the matter? Fair question, and no, you don't. Okay. Did you know that people are most likely to take a sick day on Monday, except in Australia, where the most common sick day is Tuesday? Did you know that people are least likely to take a sick day on Friday? That one actually surprised me. But apparently Fridays in the office tend to be more fun, relaxed, and social. If you work 40 hours a week, you'll most likely work around 90,000 hours during your lifetime. I feel like I did that during COVID, by the way. Yes, I do too. Researchers have found that when people are distracted by incoming emails or phone calls, their IQ drops by 10 points. For me personally, I know that I can't afford that. (laughs) And so this is the equivalent to what happens when people miss a night of sleep. It's all it's double the effect of what is experienced by marijuana smokers. So I'm wondering if my IQ points dropped a little bit just now, just listening to the trivia, but we'll let that go for right now. But uh, let's, let's get to, to some more serious stuff here, Michael. Can you help introduce our special guest who has a different kind of workplace scoop? Sure. So our partner... In Chicago, Renee Coover, or as Brad has called Cuvée, yes, the French is term, joining us today. So, Renee, uh, a little bit of our her background. She graduated from the University of Miami in Ohio with a degree in psychology and vocal performance. Yes, you heard that right. Renee Coover is an opera singer. She went to DePaul University College of Law. Uh, she's, a, a, as I said, a partner in our Chicago office. She's been an Illinois rising star for many years now and really started her career as an employment lawyer. And even today, that just consistently is uh, kind of a theme of what she works on. She is our go-to employment person here at Bertadotto. Uh, Renee gave a TED Talk several years ago that has had 58,000 views called Taking Back Your Pregnancy Rights. She is married to a successful attorney, Phil Coover. He is a real estate attorney. And then she has had two children since she's been here at Bertadotto, Liam and Mabel. Welcome, Renee. Thanks, Michael. And correct me if I'm wrong, Renee, Phil has his own podcast. Is that right? Yeah, I was just about to say, I have to plug my husband, right? And (laughs) my husband actually was probably one of the first people I know to do a podcast. It's called Real Estate for Breakfast. And it's the uh, take on real estate from a commercial real estate attorney's point of view. So tune in after you turn into this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Now, guys, while the law always seems to evolve at a rapid pace uh, with these ever-changing rules and regulations an employer must follow, uh, you know, it's it's difficult uh, to, to employ people. And the story of, of, of employment disputes seem to happen uh, more each day. Um, and, you know, we've seen it from the business point owner's point of view. Sometimes we see it from other people's, uh, from the, uh, the employee's point of view. And, and Renee, I know over the years you've run into many strange stories and uh, you learned that employers, employees uh, have a lot of things they say and then they do that, uh, as they say, sometimes they do the darndest things. You're not sure why they do it, but they do it. And I'd love for you to share one of your stories today. Yeah, I'm happy to. So this story really starts out like a bad afternoon talk show, unfortunately. <laughs> so Renee, is this like chairs across the room, Jerry Springer bad? <laughs> well, well, we'll find out. So I was brought in to deal with an employee discrimination and retaliation complaint, and it took many twists and turns as this employee had lobbed 
uh, a lot of allegations at her former employer. And it was everything from lack of management, uh, management being hurtful and inappropriate in what they said to her. And she even alleged that she received threats from other employees to take her out or to harm her. Well, so we, we, we definitely piqued my interest. And I think we do have some Jerry Springer like moments if we have threats. So it was like, you know, a chair in the air. Maybe that makes it more fun. But <laughs> yeah, it, it unfolds much like a Jerry Springer episode. Uh, my firm actually represented the PEO, which is the Professional Employer Organization for an in home healthcare company. Yeah. And for those of you who are not familiar with the PEO, it's it's really common out there, and it's technically a company that comes alongside your business and co-employs the employees with you, and the PEO's function essentially is your back office HR, and they administer payroll and benefits kind of as a third party, but they also, from a you know IRS perspective, are part a, a technically a co-employer and and this actually you could do you know a whole episode on this just how some states regulate them differently than others exactly and and by having this outside vendor essentially who's acting as the co-employer it can lead to issues if there's a lack of communication between the peo and the employer and we've seen this in a lot of different uh, employment cases in this particular case, we got brought in as counsel for the PEO when the PEO was named in a charge of discrimination, which had been filed by this former employee of the home, home health company. So wait, let me get this straight. The PEO can get sued even though it really wasn't in charge of this employee? Yes. So because that PEO is the co-employer uh, of this employee, a lot of times the PEO will also get named as a defendant in these discrimination or retaliation lawsuits. In this case, the, the former employer had been employed for this home health company in the billing department, and she made several complaints to management about her supervisors, her coworkers, her general disdain really for the operations and the management of the company. And the company had held some meetings to discuss her complaints, but from what we gathered when we got involved, this home health company didn't take her complaints very seriously. So they really thought she was just one of those people that constantly wants to complain. And she kept coming to management with what they considered to be very petty and unfounded uh, allegations against other employees and some of the members of management. So it sounds like she, we had a lot of smoke there, but really no fire. <laughs> right. Well, so within the span of three weeks, uh, even though this employer had, had never before received any performance reviews at, at all, whether good or bad, um, she was given in the span of three weeks two counseling statements for poor performance. Uh, she, let's see, had failed to request time off for their policy. She was making too many personal phone calls as, as management determined. Uh, ignoring requests by management, violating the dress code, and just generally being disruptive. And ultimately, she was what they call a no-call, no-show. So she didn't turn up for work two days in a row. Uh, and that led to her immediate termination by this company. So it sounds like uh, she was not actually looking in the mirror as she was making all those complaints. Yeah, it was... When we stepped into this case, it really became clear that in a lot of ways, this employee who was making all of these allegations was actually the harasser, uh, according to the employees that we, that we had uh, interviewed. And so when we stepped in, she had already filed a charge of discrimination with the EEOC, which is the, the mandated first step before you can just go file a discrimination lawsuit in court. Um, but then after the EEOC, she had filed a lawsuit in the circuit court alleging age discrimination as well as retaliation. So vocabulary word for today is EEOC. It stands for Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which can be a state or federal agency that administers and enforces civil rights laws against workplace discrimination. Exactly. And the... Uh, 
EEOC is, as I was saying, your first step that you have to go through before you can file a lawsuit. Now, from the home health company standpoint, you know, you, they, they get this charge filed against them, were brought in on the PEO side, and the company felt like they had done everything by the book. They had an employee handbook, they had employment policies and procedures, they felt like they had oversight. And when we came in, we immediately launched an, an investigation, and that really involved reviewing all of their policies all emails and notes and text messages between all of these employees, uh, including the charging employee, as well as management. And then we came in and actually interviewed about 15 different employees and members of management from the top down to really figure out what was going on. So based on all this, what did you learn? Well, it became very apparent that this was very much like a Mori Povich episode. Um, I think of it kind of as like a fishbowl because all of the employees sat in a very large space in the middle of this uh, floor. And then all of the management was in offices that circled them. So it was kind of like a bullpen. And uh, it became apparent that there were a lot of allegations and inappropriate name calling Terms got thrown around, a lot of inappropriate statements by the staff members to each other. And there was just this general lack of control by management. The, the employees had very little day-to-day -day oversight, and there was definitely a fair amount of drama that went on both inside this little fishbowl and then actually outside too, in the parking lot and when they were coming and going from the workplace. It was just, it was crazy because when we interviewed the other employees, they were quick to actually put the blame back on this employee who was terminated. And what we found out from all these interviews was that she was the one harassing and bullying these other employees, you know, threatening them on their way out to their car, uh, you know, harassing them when they would get into their car. And as far as we could tell, she was never, from these other employees' standpoint, a victim of discrimination. But this, you know, of course, flew in the face of all of her detailed allegations about inappropriate age-related comments that were made to her. Well, I thought having teenage daughters was dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of her allegations? <laughs> well, the, the primary allegation that a lot of this hinged on was that she had been fired unfairly, and according to her, for uh, being in a car accident, allegedly. She said she couldn't come to work because she was in this car accident. And the company alleged that she was just a no-show for two days without ever giving them any notice that she had been in this car accident. Uh, they asked her for a police report from this car accident and she kept, you know, she failed to produce one. And the uh, employee alleged that this was unfair treatment essentially because she was being asked to give them a police report and no one it took actually prove that she'd been in this car accident and no one else was, you know, held to that same standard. Um, she also had alleged that she left messages for her supervisor, phone messages after this accident. And so to call her a no show and a no call was false. Uh, so we had a very big discrepancy between what the employer was saying and what this employee alleged. All right. So we got a pretty crazy story here. A lot of allegations, uh, uh, seems like from both sides. Turns out the person may who filed the suit with the um, after going to the EOC could be the bully. Um, and then no shows for work. Uh, so I think we need to dive deeper into these details, but let's do so after the break. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back. We just heard a story with lots of drama, lots of drama, unproven car wrecks, he said, she said moments. Um, and what we're seeing is is why it's so difficult to actually run a business 
uh, when you feel like every day could be on a bad uh, uh, Jerry Springer episode. Yeah, and I'm a business attorney, and and uh, and so when I talk to family lawyers and employment lawyers and realize that in addition to just normal things you got to do as a lawyer, that you got to interject emotion into it, it it becomes quite challenging. And to be sure, employment law is filled with emotion. And we're seeing right now with COVID-19 that the workplace has changed already in such a short amount of time. And, and we're already starting to see an uptick in litigation uh, employees filing discrimination and retaliation claims against their former employers for being laid off or terminated during the pandemic. Yes, it really does bring up a lot of emotion when an employee is terminated and, and they really want to feel vindicated. And I think back to my very early days when I first started my legal career, it was in family law. And there are uh, it's uncanny, but there are a lot of similarities sometimes between the workplace and, and two divorcing spouses. But when that uh, employee gets terminated or laid off, they feel like they need you know, some sort of vindication. And so they file a lawsuit or an EEOC charge. And as an employer, it can be really difficult to defend one of these charges, even if there are policies in place. And that's what we've come to learn is developing policies is the half of it, right? Ensuring that your management is actually trained on how to implement these policies and your staff is trained on how to also implement and follow the policies. That's really the challenging part. So going back to your story, is is that what was happening? I, yes, that's exactly what was happening in this story. So we interviewed all of these employees and we quickly realized that Although the employees had a general idea of how to appropriately operate in the workplace, they were never provided any sort of training or general oversight on the policies that they were supposed to be following. So when it came to knowledge of these policies, like where would I find a handbook or where are the workplace posters that the employer is required to post in a, in a public place um, or how would I submit a complaint to management? or who's in charge of administering the policies. The employees really had no idea. And actually the only employee that knew how to do all of these things was the employee who had filed the charge. So she apparently reviewed all of the policies, but none of her uh, team members did. Ironic. Um, so we always tell our clients, you know, if you don't consistently dispense policies or you don't adequately train, on your policies is it's a recipe for litigation. I agree completely. And in this story, it was, there was really a serious disconnect between our PEO client who had developed the policies for this home health agency or company. And then the company itself who was supposed to train the employees on the policies, administer and enforce them. And then there was another disconnect with the employees who were tasked with following these policies, but didn't even know where to locate them. So, Michael, you kind of started off with um, talking about this. This story happened pre-COVID, but now that we have COVID, the impact um, that is adversely affecting clients, I, I'm assuming it's, it's a lot worse than it used to be. Yeah, I, you know, just in this short span of a few months, we have seen already a lot of of clients who are dealing with, you know, receiving emails and text messages and phone calls from disgruntled employees, and they don't feel safe, right, returning to the workplace for myriad reasons. And anytime you have an employee not wanting to return, who doesn't feel safe to come back, uh, whatever that reason may be, you really need to spring into action to evaluate the entire situation. You don't want to be on the defensive side of one of these discrimination or retaliation lawsuits because it's always going to be an uphill battle. Uh, the burden shifts to the employer quickly to prove that they have not done nothing wrong. So if you do have an employee right now, especially who doesn't feel comfortable coming back to the workplace or fears for their safety, you want to engage in an interactive process with that employee. Make sure you talk to them, find out their specific concerns, and see if it is possible to accommodate them before just terminating them. Um, strategizing a safe return to the workplace when it's possible is really going to reduce your risk of litigation. 
Yeah, we talked earlier about the emotional element of employment situations. I mean, and I think all of us get it, right? This is their livelihood. And if that's threatened, um, you know, it can invoke all sorts of emotion. Now you add to that the emotion of fear that goes with this pandemic. And, you know, there's, there's just, it's a highly charged situation. So I agree with Renee that right now it's especially crucial to ensure that your policies are uniform. As employees start returning to the workplace, uh, we have all sorts of new safety precautions and procedures in place that really the workplace hasn't seen before. It's new territory for everybody. And not only do we need to focus on who to bring back, when and how, but we need to evaluate the safety procedures once the employees are actually back in the office uh, to ensure that you know these policies are implemented consistently and without discrimination. All great points. So let's start closing out today. And Renee, let's start with you first. What are some of the takeaways we can provide our audience? I I would say ultimately this particular case settled, but it was after two years of litigation and the client had paid us thousands of dollars in legal fees to defend this uh, former employee's allegations. And it was clear when we came in to us as outsiders that the company had adequate policies and procedures in place, but what they were lacking was training and consistency, transparency in these procedures, and ultimately equality in the implementation of these policies. Uh, It looked like from when we came in that they could have discriminatory policies, not intentionally, but just in the way they were administered. So that was their weak spot. And I think this is so important that you routinely train your management as well as new and current employees on your handbook and your policies. And I think one one thing that a lot of employers fail to do is once you have that employee sign uh, an employee handbook or uh, an employee policy, you always want to get that acknowledgement in right to ensure that you have proof that the employee has signed for the handbook, they've received it, and hopefully they've read it, right? Because that will really help uh, going forward, again, to reduce your risk of litigation. Yeah, great points. Uh, Michael, what about some takeaways that you can provide today? One of my friends who's now retired and was a client uh, when he was CEO of a pretty big company. Every time I would check in with him and I'd ask how everything was going, he would always say, perfect, except for the people. (laughs) Now, to be fair, he was an introvert. (laughs) So, but I do suspect if you asked him that question right now, he would say, just don't hire any people. But since that's probably not possible, I don't think we have any real advancements in artificial intelligence to the point that we don't need humans um, I would just conclude, I mean, and this is intuitive for our COOs out there and any of our operations-minded listeners, but the importance of policies and procedures cannot be overstated. Um, the hard part about the policies, as we got to a little bit today, is the implementation and the training. And so when you're dealing with employment-related policies, the risk goes beyond the normal things. Like, you know, you may have some policies that can lead to inefficiency in the office and stuff that's very correctable. But here, again, we're dealing with the highly charged emotion that goes with employment and the real risk of litigation. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, if you like this episode, please subscribe, make sure to give us a five-star rating and share with your friends. You can also sign up for the Bertadotto newsletter by going to our website at bertadotto.com. Bertadotto is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadotto. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.